from Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering AWS reInvent 2018. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services, Intel, and their ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. Live here in Las Vegas for AWS reInvent 2018. All the actions happening for Amazon Web Services. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Dave, six years covering Amazon. Um, great opportunity, a lot of news. Uh, Red Hat's a big part of it. Mike Ferris is here, Vice President of Technical Business Development for Red Hat. Welcome back, good to see you. Likewise. A lot's going on with you guys since our Red Hat Summit days in San Francisco just a few months ago. Yep. Big news hit. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> the, the bomb around the world, the, the rock, and, rock that hit the ground really hard, shook everyone up, surprised everyone, including me. I'm like, wow, IBM and Red Hat. What an interesting relationship. Obviously the history with IBM has been good. Talk about the announcement with IBM because this is huge. Of course. Big numbers, but also impact-wise, pretty big. Yeah, it's, it's exciting times, right? And, and you know, if you kind of look at, you know, from the perspective of Red Hat in this, you know, this, this will allow us to really scale and accelerate what we've already been doing uh, for the past, you know, since really the 1994 era uh, when Red Hat was founded and, you know, it kind of validates a lot of what we've put into open source and enterprise customers since then. You know, we really see a couple of key, key outtakes from this, one of which is, you know, certainly it's going to give us the resources uh, to be able to, uh, to really grow at the scale that we need to. Um, it's also going to allow us to invest more in open source in emerging areas, uh, bring, the value of scale and certainly choice and flexibility to more customers. And then ultimately kind of the, the, the global advantage of hybrid and multi-cloud, we'll be able to reach more partners and customers everywhere. And yeah. it, it puts us several years ahead of where we have been, uh, or where we would have been, frankly, and, and ultimately you know, our intent is that with IBM we'll become the leading hybrid and multi-cloud provider. Yeah, Ginny, and, Ginny and Jim Whitehurst kind of ruined our Sunday. We were sitting down to watch football and then they <laughs> like, oh, yeah. got the announcement. <laughs> and then Ginny kept saying it's not back end loaded, it's not back end loaded. And then you start to realize, wow, IBM is an enormous business of managing applications that need to be modernized and OpenShift is obviously a, a great place to do that. So it's, it's got to be super exciting for you guys to have that giant new opportunity to go after as well as global scale that you didn't Absolutely. have before. And you know, this, this extends the stuff that we did, announced in May at Red Hat yeah. Summit with IBM, yeah. where we really focused on how do we take uh, WebSphere DB2 MQ running on IBM Cloud Private, running on OpenShift, and make that the hybrid choice. Uh, and so you know, it's a yeah. natural extension of what we've already been doing, and it gives us a lot more resources than we would have otherwise. This is a good, good pivot into the next segment I want to yep. chat about is that, uh, is RHEL, and what people don't, might not understand from the announcement is the synergies you guys have with IBM, because you know, being a student of Red Hat, being just in the industry, um, when you guys were, you know, rebels, you know, open source, second tier citizen in the enterprise, the adoption then became tier one service. I mean, you guys have level of service that's what, 17 years or something, huge numbers? Yep. But remember, where it all started, yep. right? And then you became a tier one supplier to almost all the enterprises. So you're actually a product company, <laughs> as well as a huge open source player, that, that's, that's powerful and unique. Absolutely, and even if you look at kind of what Amazon is doing this week and have yep. been doing over the years, right, they're a huge you know, value add provider of open source technology as well. And you know, one of the statements that we've always made is the public cloud would not exist if not for Linux and open source. And so everything has been based upon that. There, there's one provider that doesn't use Linux as the base of their platform. Uh, but certainly as we've, we've taken you know, the inroads into the enterprise, I mean, I was there when it started with you know, just turning Red Hat Enterprise Linux on and then bringing it from the edge of network <laughs> into the data center and talking about you know, major providers like Oracle, HP, Dell, IBM as part of that. You know, now we're looking at it as the de facto standard and everyone, including yeah. you know, Amazon and all of its competitors are really invested heavily in the open source world. And so let's talk about the, the, the impact to the products, okay? So one of the things that was come up, on, uh, at least on my Twitter feed on the conversations is, okay, it's going to take some time to close the deal. You're still Red Hat, you're still doing your things. What's the impact to the customers and to the ecosystem in your mind? How are you guys talking about that right now? See, it's more of the same, keep the Red Hat the same, unique, independent. Uh, what new things are going um, to come out of this? So, so to be clear, the, the deal has not closed, yeah. right? So there's not a lot we're going to say otherwise. A year away. Yeah, yeah but, you got but a lot of work to do. Our focus is, is, is all what it always has been, is let's, let's build the yeah. best enterprise products using the open source development model and make those available across all public and hybrid cloud environments. At a, at a service level that's enterprise 
multi-year, the old Red Hat model, the same Red Hat model. Yep. All right, so, yeah, so, but, but, but let, me, let me follow up on that, because you're a believer in multi-cloud, we're a believer in whatever you call it, multiple clouds, the customers are going to use multiple clouds. Yes. We believe that, you believe that. It seems like Amazon has a slightly different perspective on that, and that they're one cloud. there's greater value, right, because they're one cloud, there's greater value, and go, but it seems like the reality when you talk to customers is, we're not just one company, we've got different divisions, we've, and, and eventually we've got to bring those together in some kind of abstraction layer, that's what you guys yeah. want to be, right? So your perspectives on, on multi-cloud. Absolutely, so e each individual department, each project, each developer, in all of these major enterprises, you know, has a different advantage. And yes, there are corporate standards, uh, golden masters of RHEL that get produced, everybody's supposed to be using, but you know, the, the practicalities of how you develop software, especially in the age of DevOps and containers and moving forward is, is actually you have to have the choice necessary to meet your specific needs. And while we will absolutely do everything we can to make sure that things are consistent, I mean, we started this with RHEL consistency on and off premise uh, when we did the original Amazon relationship. You know, the, the, the point is, you need to be able to give people the flexibility and choice that they desire, regardless of what area of the company that they're in. And that's, that's going to be the focus, you know, regardless whether it's Microsoft, Amazon, Google, IBM clouds, yeah. you know, international clouds with Alibaba, it's all the same to us. We have to make sure it's there. What's always great about the cloud show, especially this one, it's one of my favorites, because there's really is DevOps deep in the, in the mindset culture. As you see AI and machine learning start to get powered by all this great resources, compute, et cetera, the developers are going crazy. It's going to be another renaissance in software development. And then you got things like Kubernetes and containers now being streamed. Kubernetes almost, de I say, de facto standard. Yep. Um, absolutely happened. You guys had a big part of making that happen. People are now agreeing on things. So the formation's coming together pretty quickly. You're seeing the growth. We're hearing terms like co-creation, co-opetition. Those are signals for large rising tide. <laughs> Your thoughts? So, so you know, it's, it's interesting. We were an early investor in Kubernetes. We actually launched OpenShift prior to Kubernetes, right. and then we adopted it, made a shift of our platform before it was too late. We did the same thing with hypervisors and we moved from Zen to KVM. But you know, this, this overall approach is once we see the, the energy happening both in the community and the early customers, Good point. then you see the partners start to come on board. It becomes the de facto standard. It's really crucial for us as an open source company to make sure we follow those trends and then we help mature them across the business ecosystem. And that's something we, you know, we've loved being able to engage with. I mean, Google certainly you know, instigated the Kubernetes movement, um, but then it starts to propagate just like on the OpenStack side. It came out of Rackspace and NASA and then moved on to different areas. And so, you know, our focus is how do we continue that choice and that evolution overall? How would you talk about the impact of Kubernetes? If someone says, hey Mike, what's the real impact of Kubernetes? What is it going to accomplish at the end of the day? It, what's it, your view of that? It, it will have the same impact that the Linux kernel standardization has had, you know, but in this case for microservices and application packaging and being able to do DevOps much more efficiently across heterogeneous platforms. Does it make it easier or more, um, less painful, or does it go away? Is it automated under the covers? Yeah. I mean, this is a big, awesome opportunity. So, so the orchestration capabilities of Kubernetes combined with all the other tools that surround key container platforms like OpenShift, right, really give that developer the full life cycle environment to be able to take something from concept through yeah. deployment and then on into maintenance phases. Yeah. And you know, what, what we end up doing is we look at, okay, the technologies are there, what value adds do we have around that to make sure that that a customer and a developer can actually maintain this thing long term and keep their enterprise applications up. Yeah. So, so security, for basement. example. Security is a great example, right? How do we make sure that every container that gets deployed, you know, on Kubernetes platforms or by Kubernetes platforms, that every container that's deployed, which keep in mind is an operating system, it has an operating system in the container itself, how does that kept up to date? How do you make sure that when the next security errata is released, from us or you know, a different vendor possibly, how do you make sure that that container is secure? And you know, we've done a lot in, the, in, the, in, our, in our registry as well as our, our catalog to make sure that all of our partners and customers can see their containers, know what, what, what grade they have in a security context, and be able to grow that. And that's one of the core things that we see adding into this Kubernetes value and the orchestration yeah. level. All yeah, it's not a trivial technical problem either. No. And sometimes it, microservices aren't so micro. And, <laughs> and it's been core to what we've done from RHEL from the start, yeah. right? It's been how do we bring that enterprise value into technology that is maturing out of the open source community and make that available to customers. Yeah, and one of the key things you guys, first of all, OpenShift has been phenomenal. You guys have done a great job with that. We've been watching that grow. But I think a real seminal moment was the CoreOS uh, acquisition. Sure. That was a real um, turbo boost yep. for you guys. Great acquisition, um, fits in with the culture, and then Kubernetes just lifted from that, not that was the point, but like at the timing of all this, Kubernetes gets mainstream lift, 
People recognize the standardization on it is a good thing, and then boom, developers are getting engaged. Yeah, if, if you see what you know, the, the core OS environment has brought us from over there updates for our platforms to, to being able to talk about a registry and you know, the Quay environment, yeah. you know, being able to say that is kind of additive to this overall messaging really rounds out the offering for us and allows us to participate even more deeply in the communities. Well, we're looking forward to continuing to cover. We love Kubernetes, we've got a special report called uh, Kubernetes Special Report on SiliconAngle.com, it's called The Rise of Kubernetes. It's a dedicated set of content. We're publishing a lot on Kubernetes. Final question I want to get to you, so I think it's super important. Um, what's the relationship that you have with AWS? And take some time to explain sure. the, the, the partnership, how many years, what you guys are doing together. I know you, you're actively involved. Take, take a minute. I mean, it, it is somewhat blurry. It's been a long time. So uh, 2007 era is when we started in depth. Uh, with them, and you know, I can remember the early days actually in the development of, of S3 prior to EC2, being able to say, all right, what is this thing, um, and, and you know, how does Red Hat participate in this? And I think yesterday Terry Wise even mentioned that we were, we were one of the first partners uh, to actually engage in the consumption model, and you know, he claiming yeah. partial credit yeah. for our $34 billion valuation that we just got announced. <laughs> but you know, overall, the relationship really spawned out of that how do we help build a cloud, and how do we all offer our products to our customers in a more flexible way? And so you know, that snowballed over the years from you know, just early adopters being able to play with it to now where you see it's you know, many, many millions of dollars that are being generated in customers, and I think in the hundreds of millions of hours of our products being consumed, you know, at least within a month, if not shorter time frames, yeah. every, you know, every, every, every time period we have. And you know, that's an unsung um, benefit that people don't, might not know about it with Red Hat is that you guys are in early markets because one, everyone uses Linux yep. for pretty much yep. these days, <laughs> for anything core, meaningful, uh, and you listen to community. Um, and so you guys are always involved in big moving things. Cloud, Amazon, 2007, people could, it was command line back then. Yep, yep. <laughs> it wasn't even, I think Rightscale just came on, online that year. Yep, I hey, remember, yep, spoke with them as well at the time. So you remember, so you guys are always in all these markets, so it's a good indicator. You guys are a bellwether, I think it's a good, beacon to look at. And, and we do this certainly on the container space, yeah. in the middleware yeah. space, in the storage space. You know, we replicate this, this model, and including in management, about how do we actually invest in the right places where we see the industry and community yeah. going so we can actually help those companies. And you're very partner friendly, you bring a lot to the table. I love the open source ethos. I think that's the future. The future of that ethos of con contributing to get value downstream is going to be a business practice, not just software. So right. you guys are a big part of the industry on that. I really want to give you guys props for that. Okay, more CUBE coverage here in, in Las Vegas, Ravis reInvent after the short break. More live coverage. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. <laughs>